and I had a lot yeah. of grief and stuff. Um, not really so much for my loss of him, but the thing that I was the most upset about is that he was, I, I remember the day that I got into medical school, he just started crying because I had been struggling to get into medical school for a while and he was kind of worried. That's about really cute. Like that. And I hadn't yeah. seen him cry like that. I mean, he just like broke down and he said that you're going to be amazing. He's like, nothing is going to stop you now. You are amazing. Yeah. You're really, really good at what you do. You, you helped me a lot. Yeah. I've talked to a lot of, I've talked to a lot of psychiatrists. And, and so he saw that, right? He saw that like, you know, when I, I mean, I had a 2.6 GPA and was struggling to get into medical school. I never thought I'd be faculty at Harvard Medical School. And, yeah. and he said like, nothing is going to be able to stop you and that you should do good and you should help people. That's really cute. Yeah. And so <laughs> what, what I was sad about is actually that he didn't get to see that. So eight months after I got into medical school, he passed away. And, and so yeah. the, the thing that makes me sad, like, I remember like the day that, that I, I matched. Yeah, I can relate to that a lot, actually. Because I'm worried I want my dad to see me happy. I'm sorry? Before he I want my dad to see me happy before he dies. Good. And I hope he's seeing me happy now. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so... Um, Thanks for coming back on, man. How are you? How's your new year? I don't see you, by the way. Uh, oh. You're not sharing video. Yeah. Okay, hold on. Let's fix it's that. very windy outside. Actually, Alexa, what's the wind speed? Nine point two miles per hour. I hear it. That doesn't sound like that's that fast, but I hear it pretty crazy. Okay, can you see me now? Uh. Yeah, I uh, don't. I don't see you. I'm you really bright now. You. Oh. oh, no. Oh, turn on. I have to hit the turn on camera button. Okay, boomer. <laughs> That's an important button. Okay. There we go. By the way, uh, uh, so I don't know if this is still the case, but uh, one of my developers uh -huh. who watches your stream, uh -huh. he said he uh, he was looking at he was watching you look at your own chat, and that he it looked like people were just typing boomer in all caps to you but they're doing an emoji but you, you don't have the extension better twitch tv or you didn't have it at the time to see the emoji they're not actually typing boomer to you in all caps oh i thought they were typing boomer to me in all caps isn't that a pretty fucking yeah, boomer so, thing because i see yes I so see. what's actually happening is they're doing this emote you need to get oh it's frank or face z i think maybe i think somebody just uh, enabled that because i see lots of like faces man this is like the black and white boomer yeah, emote. But, yeah, now you see it. Okay, good. Because yeah, last somebody, time you, before, somebody now you that for me. They used to type boomer to you in all caps. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I thought that was just what they typed. <laughs> yeah, that, that would be rude. I think. <laughs> I mean, is this less? I mean, I thought it was endearing. It's, okay. I I right, I, yeah. I sort of feel like I'm I'm Twitch's pet boomer. Yeah, <laughs> Twitch loves watching you try to use. <laughs> technology it's very yeah, funny I mean, you? it's i feel like a you know like a three-legged dog that people are cheering on <laughs> yeah, that's that's yeah that's funny so i, like I mean i feel loved you are loved i we we're missing a personality like you in the space because uh if it's just a bunch of streamers talking interacting with each other oh they're giving you hearts in the chat when it's just a bunch of streamers talking, interacting with each other, and we're all living in this bubble, uh huh. Then uh, it's uh, I, I don't know the best way to word this, but we definitely get more caught up in all the negatives that uh, result from being exposed to large groups of people. Yeah, and forget to step back and uh, think about it critically. Yeah, I mean, I think there's certainly a, a certain degree of myopia that happens right like so people kind of get super zoomed in on their life and their sphere and it's really easy for toxicity to kind of get built up like even if you look at spiritual communities like if you go to a monastery and stuff like a lot of that like My and these kind of yeah it's nearsightedness yeah okay i looked it up you know yeah um so so it's it's kind of like you know everyone just kind of sees what's in front of them and it, it can get to be i mean it can just become really toxic and like even when i went to these ashrams and stuff in india like a lot of times there's just a lot of toxicity there and a lot of ego and wait the wind is so crazy that's like i couldn't hear you uh, i think my thing isn't closed all the way okay 
OCD. I, I'm going to open it for one second just so they, the stream can maybe hear. Okay. Yeah, it was open a little bit. Okay. I don't know if they heard that. Okay. We're going to. Yeah. So how was your, how was your new year? Um, okay. So this whole going into the holidays, I was worried because most years when I'm going into the holidays, uh, it's a lonely experience and it's a lonely experience, uh, because it's a lonely experience because, well, um, we never celebrated any holidays in, in my family and I, my, I have very little family. So I just have my parents and my brother, right? Um, uh, so I see like a lot of pictures of other people having fun with their family and it always, uh, makes me feel left out. So most years I'll go visit and just, we will hang out and do stuff. Like, I don't know. We usually just go to dinner or something, but, mm -hmm. uh, so, so I, I don't feel that as much, but I, I, I uh, was sick also. And then I kind of, I was, I've been really sick and then I needed to stay here. I think and I tried to get them to come here. They didn't want to. And then, but then I, I just try to avoid looking at social media and seeing all happy pictures and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it wasn't, it wasn't too bad. Yeah. So it sounds like you were sick and it wasn't too bad is how the holidays were. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't too bad. <laughs> okay. But e even if you do go home, it sounds like even if you're with your family, you feel what exactly? Hmm. We're, we're diving right in, by the way, unless you want to talk yeah, about I, something. Yeah, I, I see that. Uh, <laughs> what do I feel? It feels like something's missing. Yeah. Um. Huh. Wait, why is everyone doing this face? Are you guys scared? I saw it spamming really hard on the other side. Okay. Um, Let's not I'm worry about to... Twitch chat for a second. Yeah, I know. I mean, I'll, maybe I'll close it. Yeah. So I can get more immersed. Because I, I saw it in peripheral. Um, This sense of community that people usually get or in family mm -hmm. from the holidays, I, I've, I've, I guess I've been envious of it. Yeah. Um, and uh, even if we get together, um, it just feels like our family is really small and that it's not as a happy experience as the bigger families who have more yeah. than just their immediate family. Yeah. Well, so, and how do you feel when you look at pictures of other people over the holidays? What's the main thing that feels different? I have like different? a FOMO feeling. Yeah. Like so, a... what, 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 so let's talk about that for a second, right? So fear of yeah, yeah, FOMO, yeah. FOMO is like, sure, it's fear of missing out, but what is it about those pictures that you're missing? Because FOMO can mean different things to different people. For some people, it's like right, they're in yeah. a particular place. For some people, it's like sun which is what my FOMO is like because I'm in Boston, right? For okay. some people, it's like there's... Um, I just want to see a lot of smiling faces around me. Yeah. I guess. Yeah. And you, you keep uh, on, you keep people on talking... People I'm close to, with people I'm close to. Yeah, so you keep on talking. You use the, the adjective that you're using has to do with size. I don't know if you can... If you're noticing that. You, you Why said, is that? I don't... It doesn't seem like size is that important Yep. for... Family, yeah. Mm -hmm. But that's the words that you're using. Do you see that? You've said yeah. small like three or four times when we talk about your family and going home for the holidays. Like my yeah. family is small. So are you seeing pictures of like 15 people smiling together? I am, but I guess that's not it. It's probably just that my brother's missing. Yeah. From the picture. Yep. Yeah. Well done. Yeah. Right? So like if we yeah. think about when you go home, for, go ahead. I was trying to figure out if I can put you on the right side of my monitor. Is there a way to switch this? No, it's okay. Keep okay. going. Yeah. Yeah. So let's think about that, right? So when you go home, you feel like something is missing. Like the people that yeah. you're seeing is, are too small. Like it's like not enough family, right? It's not. It's not the full family. Yeah. Because it's not the full family. Rackful, is it because the full family? It's not the full family, yeah. Yeah, so let's just think about that for a second, right? So the reason, like, you feel like something is missing during the holidays is because something is missing during the holidays. True. Yeah. 
Um, this reminds me, I wanted to share with you because I thought of this. My dad wrote a book. He actually wrote several. But in the book, he had a fictional character mm -hmm. who was based on himself. Uh, had a different profession, but uh, the same backstory with uh, my brother who, you know, his kid who uh, committed suicide. Mm. And then he wrote the experience of the actual experience of what it felt like for him mm. when my, uh, when my brother committed suicide. And I wanted to read it to you. Sure. Thought maybe. Sure. Yeah. Please. And I, when I was 16, I, I actually uh, edited the book for my dad. So I read it all the way through back then. Huh. Because uh, he, he didn't get an editor. Um, I wasn't very good at editing. I can actually do it much better now. We, while I'm reading it, I would want to uh, change some words around. And the, anyway. Just read it. But yeah. Sure. So let me pull it. Okay. Uh, okay. So it goes. Um, so some of this is fictional. I'll give a little bit of a preface. Um, no, I'll just go right into it. I tossed and turned in bed, but couldn't fall asleep, as every night since my personal tragedy happened in midsummer of that same year. My son had been suffering from a severe depression for several months, and I did sometime fear the worst. So when my wife called me at work on that evening and said that his room was locked and he wouldn't respond to calling his name and knocking on the door, death immediately reared in my mind and my heart palpitated with a pang. I shouted, my son is dead, and I started sobbing savagely and uncontrollably. My secretary drove me home. Someone climbed to the rear window of his room and broke it, then immediately screamed to call the paramedics. Leora, uh, her name's really Judy. Judy ran to Guy's room, the secretary following on the steps. Judy came out of the room crying hysterically, her pain throbbing around me. The paramedics came, and she re-entered the room with them, but they could only confirm Guy's death. I howled even more but did not have the strength of mind to even think about entering Guy's room. I ran up and down, back and forth in the house. I sat, I stood up again, sat again, laid down on the floor and twisted in all forms and directions, but I could not escape the terrible situation. I screamed for my son and hoped that he would immediately come out of the room. I saw Judy breaking out from Guy's room, dashing past everyone in the corridor, ripping out her hair and rushing to her bedroom, door slamming behind her. And I still twisted around in frenzy. This is not true. How do I get out of this nightmare my mind raged? Where do I hide now for eternity? At nights, I could not sleep, daydreaming deliriously about my son in conversation and activity with me. During the day, I had to face all those annoying friends and colleagues who honestly, with good intentions, were torturing me with the meaningless words, all of them repeated endlessly, as if they had rehearsed together. You have your family to take care of, as well as your police work. Be strong. Someone's calling me. Sorry, 1 800 number is the worst thing. As if I needed to be told all this. Were not for these cursed obligations, I would emulate Guy's suicide and be immediately released from the pain. And anyway, how could I betray his memory by tending to things as meaningless and trivial as personal achievement, status, and career? The constant, unbearable, relentless pain weighing down on my chest like a hundred tanks parked on it, and the need to perform work and other daily duties was now utterly meaningless to watch people going places, coming back, talking and toiling for reasons that now completely escaped me. What is the meaning of all this hassle and tussle? I am dead, and these people continue their daily occupations, and I have to watch them and their utterly stupid ambitions and activities to get rich, to be powerful, to do this and that. What for, as life has already ended? And why is it that I'm dead and they're alive? And why is it they have sons to continue their existence after they're gone? And where's mine? While performing my duties as a lawyer, he wrote police inspector, but it's lawyer, really. I would feel sad, enraged, empty-headed, and exalted, concurrently or, altern or alternatively. Why can't I also depart after Guy? Maybe I will find him somewhere. But when I call him back in my dreams, he only signals that it was time for him to go on with his passage and not for me. I, I have family, duties, and a city's population to protect here. The same population who couldn't honestly give a fuck about Guy's death. Can anyone understand the city's treatment of me? As the weeks and months passed, black horror settled in my mind. 
my own darkness engulfed, sucked and suffocated me. Inescapable misery constantly bashing my heart, gashing wounds of unbearable pain. Memories of my son melted my brain like butter and boiling vapor, driving me insane. And the worst was the impossibility, the absolute impossibility to run away and to vanish and disappear. There was nowhere to hide. Except if blessed sleep came to me some nights after many hours of twisting in my bed. No appetite for food or sex or achievement whatsoever. No ambition to make even the slightest advance. Only the burden in my chest getting heavier every day and the nagging dread that in time I will forget God and desert him. And so I continued living as zomb like a zombie, grieving not only the loss of my son, but mainly the loss of my old securities, of the confident man I used to think I was, of how I imagined I could make life happen. I'll get stop for a bit. I can't fucking read it. <laughs> Take your time. Slowly I began realizing that I was separated from life because my son was my life and he would never return. I had lost my connection to the part of myself that I could not without my son satisfied. And I mourned that part of myself which my son had reflected. I mourned for me. This was the unfolding of the simple realization of why I felt dead among the living. I went to the kitchen, took a sleeping pill, sagged back inside my bedroom, and sank into a welcome, dreamless sleep. That's it. Thanks for sharing that, man. Yeah. Uh, someone asked who wrote that. My dad wrote that. It's uh, it's zero dollars on Kindle if you want it. I'll link it in the chat. So, you want a second to process and feel? Like, what are you? Oh, someone said add. No. <laughs> I hate that people would think that. <laughs> no, I'm not trying to make you money, dude. Um. Anyway, what, what were you feeling? Is that as you were reading that? Uh, it's hard to explain because um, you, uh, I think we talked about you know how there's, there's a split brain experiment, right? With the le left brain, right brain. It's not my analytical side of my brain. It's not the left brain going off. It's the right brain and it doesn't speak. Yeah. So I just feel I'm just, it just happens. It just go like, I just, it just start crying. I can't control it. I don't even think a thought mm -hmm. uh, consciously. So I don't know exactly what I'm feeling. I have to try to figure it out. Yeah. So tell me what, but I'm um, kind of just, you know, so the first thing is, I mean, so you've read that many times before, right? Yeah. Does this happen every time you read it? Yeah. And does this feel, let's start with just wide swaths. Does this feel good or bad? Well, when I was really depressed, it, it would feel good because I felt better feeling something and just crying than yeah. being completely blank. Right now, it feels bad because I've been happy. You've been unhappy. I've been happy, actually. Okay. I've been happy. These last few weeks, I've been happy. Yeah. Except for the around the holidays a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, do, so what I get from you is a profound sense of sadness and loss. And I think... Yeah. The thing that I don't understand is how much of that loss is for you, how much of that loss is for him, and how much of that loss is for your dad. I feel, I feel bad for my dad for sure. I don't know. I don't know. 
Rekvil, I have a crazy-ass non-sequitur question for you, okay? Yeah, sure. Do you want to have children one day? I always thought no, because they're scared they'd kill themselves. Yeah. So this is important. You're doing good, by the way. Thanks. And I was ready to jump into the water, but boy, did you take the high dive. Yeah, I thought I wanted to do I wanted to do it. So So. there are a lot of different directions I can go right now, but I I think I'm gonna zero on on this one thing and we can explore the others later in terms of what you're feeling and, and how to process those. Like that's There's a part of me that says that we should talk about helping you through those feelings, but there's another part of me that says, I want to go to the core of this. So when you think about having children, that is a choice between life and not life, living and not living, right? And it's the same choice that your dad makes. That's the same choice that he can't make because he lives as a zombie amongst a world of regular humans. And he's like dead on the inside and everyone around him is alive and living with their petty ambitions and joys and fears. And you just can't engage in that life. He can't. And there's a really dangerous thing because if you move towards life again, that means that you're leaving Guy behind. Why why do you say leaving behind? I think that's how your dad feels. And if you go back and kind of read through it, there's sort I saw of, that that's how he feels, yeah. yeah. That part I don't I don't fully comprehend that part. Yeah. Yeah, so I I think to a certain the only way that I think that that overlaps with you is in sort of the desire to have children or the lack thereof because you're saying that like this is a part of life that I do not want to engage in. Yeah. Right? And his difficulty is me. Yeah. is that he like want he can't engage in life because his son is dead yeah <sighs> what are you feeling i had a thought that uh, I, I thought i'm still here <laughs> how do you feel about that No. I want to blow those. Okay. Gotta stay hydrated, chat. You guys feel like crying, you should cry. Just let it out, man. Doesn't do any good staying in there. We'll talk about why I smile. We'll ask Rackful. Not a robot. Certainly not that. If only that were the case.
long nose break, huh? I washed my face too. Okay. I'm, I'm good. <sighs> can you hear me or you need headphones? I don't I don't know. I can hear you without yeah. Okay. I have I have a setup where I have it always on the speakers and also oh, got it. But yeah, I, was, I forgot I didn't have them on. <laughs> I didn't know if I was talking to no one. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I get it. So, what do you, help me understand why you shared that today? I think it was great that you did. I'm, I'm really happy. I thought it would give you a lot of insight on my past and experiences. And from a perspective of an adult at the time, because I, I was young. And yep. then, like, maybe what my childhood might have been like after that. Mm -hmm. I think it says a lot, and at the same time, but that's not a perspective on your childhood. right? That's a perspective on your dad. And we can sort of yeah. infer what things were like. Yeah, yeah that's what I'm saying, yeah. Um, but... I'm just, I'm a little bit surprised, to be honest, that he asked you to edit that at the age of 16. Like, that's some pretty heavy stuff. Yeah. Do you remember what it was like reading it at the age of 16? No. Okay, maybe I shut it out of my mind, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure I felt similar. Mm -hmm. I don't. I mean, those are the first seven pages. It's like a, maybe 200 pages. That's the opening of the that was, book. That's like page five or something, yeah. Okay, interesting. Feels like a climax, you know, just from a narrative perspective. Yeah. But, and how, do, how are you feeling now? What are you feeling? Um, a little... calmer mm -hmm. something feels nice to have shared it mm -hmm. feels like I, I uh feels like i got something off my chest yeah what did you get off your chest hmm i wonder You already know. I don't know. I'm trying to figure it out. Yeah. Something. Something. So let's think about that. Um, so the first thing is you've read this before, right? But when you read it before, you don't... Let's try to start actually by helping, maybe trying to understand like what is going... In, instead of sort of defining specifically what you got off your chest or how you're feeling better, or what is feeling better. Let's try to understand how you're feeling better. Like, what's going on inside you? Not from a specific sense, but like, what are the mechanics of okay. this situation? Yeah, yeah. So mm -hmm. you've read this before, and it evokes feelings of negativity usually, right? And sometimes when you're feeling depressed, it can feel good, because you say it feels, you feel something, but I suspect that when you're depressed and you read that, part of what feels good is resonance. It's kind of like when you when you have a breakup and you listen to like breakup songs, they hurt, but they also feel good because it's like resonant with the way that you feel. Does that make sense? Okay. So it's possible that it, you know, just feeling anything, I mean, very possible. Just the, the feeling of, yeah, you're relating to something. Yeah. So that, that like you're not, because if you think about depression, you're kind of alone. And to know that like someone else out there shares your sense of like, abject hopelessness about the rest of life can sort of feel good. And the fact that it was your dad can yeah, even yeah. feel good too, right? Because it's like, sure, yeah. at least your dad understands or you understand. Yeah. and It makes and, sense. Also, I, li I listened to a lot of uh, musicians who shared similar thoughts when I was in high school. Yeah. So we, we look, yeah, as yeah. human beings, we look for resonance. But that's not what's happening here. Right. So sometimes you read it and then you feel these negative emotions, but there's no metabolism. I get the sense that you're metabolizing something. So I have a, a sense. What do you mean by that? Yeah. So that you have this thing inside you, 
right? Like this thing that is a zombie. I think that's a great way to describe it. So for your dad, losing a son zombifies him entirely. But in your case, you were just a child and we sort of saw that there was a piece of you that was zombified. And that like this is like, sure, maybe you have bipolar or whatever. I, I really have no idea because I haven't like clinically assessed you for that, nor am I interested in doing that. That's not what the stream is about. But that you have something within you that like changes the way that you carry it. Like you started carrying something that day and you've carried it with you your entire life. And it's heavy, and it's shitty, and there are times where you take it out of your satchel, and you're like, you see it, and you hold it in your hands, and those are the times that you're depressed. And so what I think people mm, need... I, I disagree with the last part. Okay. Only when I'm holding it in my hands, you think I'm depressed? No, no, no. no. I don't think only when you're depressed is when you're holding it in your hands. I don't think that those okay. are necessarily the same, but... Okay. I, I think that some of your depression relates to that, or when you get into that depressive mindset that your mind gravitates towards those thoughts or feelings or that those thoughts and feelings lead to your depression. I think there's some kind of connection there, but it, it's not, it's not exclusive. If that makes sense. Okay. Um, and so what I, so I call this thing a sum scar. So a sum scar is a ball of undigested emotion. That's like kind of like unprocessed. And if we think about, therapy a lot of times the goal in therapy is to process our experiences and so not have them with us in kind of a raw form but to like understand them and kind of like process them so they no longer like weigh on us in the same way and i think something about this very like public sharing and it's not necessarily that it has to be public i mean you could have read it just to me but i think there is there is some strength in sort of like you sharing this and and bringing this thing within you to light because it only, it really thrives in the darkness. It doesn't thrive in the light. And if we think about experiences of what do you mean by thrive for this thing? I mean, I think it grows and it sustains itself as long as it's hidden. And that okay. when you share, if I, if I share it, then it can help it go away. Yeah. So I think, I mean, if we think about, for example, funerals, in the grieving process, the grieving oh, process is, is semi-public and semi-private. But for some reason, human beings have evolved in basically every culture that when loss happens, we share oh. that grief. And that somehow has like a better impact. Whereas when you have a loss that's very private and no one else knows, it like digs deeper. So I don't know exactly how that works. It's just sort of like an anthropologic principle. Yeah, yeah. That, uh, uh, I like that analogy yeah. to the funeral. And and so, I, I mean, when I think about your family, I think when you guys go there, the reason that something's missing is because something is, to be blunt. And secondly, because I don't know if you guys ever talk about it, right? But there can, there can be like union and community and strength in all of you guys sharing your feelings and like actually acknowledging that you miss your brother and that he's gone and that it's shitty that he's gone and your dad. Yeah. It, go ahead. I, I'm curious what you're going to say. Last, last, I'll let you, let you finish first. And the last thing is that, you, you know, I think that your dad lost his son, but he also lost a son. And I think it's fine for you to not be able to live for power or promotion. But I think there's plenty to live for with you and your other brother and presumably his wife, your mom. Right? I'm not saying that he is not allowed to feel devastated and destroyed and like he wants to escape. But like, let's remember that because I, I, I remember feeling this way when, when I actually, so when I lost my dad, my grandmother kept on wailing about how she lost her son, she lost her son, she lost her son. At some point I got pissed off because I was like, you still have three children that are alive and you like, and one of them is your son. And, mm -hmm. and it's sort of like she never kind of, and it was almost, I don't know how much I'm, you know, interpreting things, but I, I could almost see the pain in my uncle's face that like, she yeah, felt like yeah. she had lost everything. Makes sense, yeah. And, and so I think that there's, you know, I get that your dad is feeling 
grief and devastated and I can't really know what that's like. And it's easy for me to say, you know, there's a way forward, but I, I think definitely in your case there is, and hopefully in his case there is. And people have lost children before. And in, in my grandmother's case, like I know that she can still find joy in the world with my dad passing away because I'm alive and my brother's alive and she likes my kids a lot. So she happens to think that my oldest daughter is my dad reincarnated. I don't. Wait, really so she's her. a great grandmother. Yep. Okay. So she's old, and and we just saw her over the the break when I was in Houston, actually. Uh huh. Um. And and so I think that there's still joy, and people in in chat were wondering why I was smiling when you were like devastated. Like, what do you feel when I smile, Reckful? I I assume that when you're smiling something clicked in your brain a certain way to treat my situation. Okay. That is sometimes true, but most of my smile doesn't come from clicking because that's like analytical and it also doesn't come from treating. I don't smile because I think I know how to help you. I don't smile because of a particular thought. I smile because I have hope. I have smile because when I look at you, I smile because when I look at you, I see someone who's starting to like unzombify. Mm -hmm. I smile because I, I am I am starting to unzombify. Yeah, and I smile because I can see it happening, and it's a beautiful thing. Thanks. I smile because I ask you the question: Are you going to have kids one day? And I hope the answer is yes. Because you're going to know a joy that. I don't know that it's going to outweigh any grief because I haven't lost a brother yet, but it sure outweighs the grief of losing a father. And that your life can be full. I'm sorry, you lost, I'm sorry you lost your father, man. That's okay. I mean, it was, it was his time. I'm cool with it. It was his time. But, um, what you were saying about how your grandma thought she lost everything when your father died? Yeah. And that your uncle was sad. Mm -hmm. um, I don't feel sad about my that because if your uncle had died maybe she would have i assume she would have also felt like she lost everything i think she could have lost any son any or daughter and feel like she lost everything same yeah. with my dad if he had lost me he would also feel like he lost everything or if yeah. he had lost gary he would also feel like he lost everything i think each each of us is everything you know mm -hmm. But that's why I smile. Why are you smiling? Yeah, because I'm relating to you. What are you relating to? The loss of a family member. Yeah. I'm curious, have you ever talked to your dad about that? what he says about the dream? Is that... You no. said something about, like, when he says he has a dream where he sees your... He sees Guy and Guy tells him that it was his time. Yeah, those, those kind of things. I uh, not more interested now that you mentioned it, but usually I uh, dismiss it all. Just trying not to think things like that, but uh, yeah, dreams. Why not? Dreams are, Why do you dismiss it? Not sure. I'm trying to think about it. There's a lot of things I dismiss in my life all the time and uh, avoid or ignore and I recently stopped started doing it less uh, I kind of want to talk about that um, Good. Like, I uh, think that's, that's a big reason why you may be feeling better yeah just just little things are changing so I'm, I'm able to like clean my room and uh, you know like do laundry and just, I don't know put things away and those things were always very hard for me. Mm -hmm. like it would weigh on me to do it. And now I do it, I'm like, oh, I see the benefit of this. Yeah. It feels better in here now. Yeah. Um. But uh, why did I bring that up? I brought it up for a reason. Yeah, I think I it's forgot. very important. So, okay. Rackful, I think what you're starting to do is become whole. You're starting to become yeah. a complete person. And so far in your life, you've lived a life of two-facedness because you've got the zombiness within you. And then you try to live this life outside of it. 
it, right? Like there, it's a struggle between pushing that grief down and pushing it away and trying to forget and trying to twist away in a direction that you can never twist away. And then you yeah. try to build this life that everyone tells you you have to build, but it's not authentic. It's not complete. It's like on or off. And so life is not complete or whole. And what I see that I think is actually like what I'm hoping for, and I think I see it, is that you're starting to integrate. You're starting to let these feelings kind of come out and you're, you're accepting them. You're accepting your loss in a way that, you know, you kind of didn't have a choice. But like, I don't know that you've ever really accepted it. And I think you're in the process of accepting it. Having a choice, I think, would be even harder because if I feel like I, if I felt like I could have saved him, that would weigh on me more. No, I mean I don't. But mean, I didn't. No, I felt like I was too young. Well, I, so, oh, you didn't mean, you didn't mean that. Yeah, so I don't what mean, do you mean like. By the, have a yeah, so I, I, I mean, so you don't have a cho choice in losing him, but you do have a choice in letting him go. Yeah. Right. I don't know if that makes sense, but. It, it, it and it's not that letting him go means that you don't love him and it's not that letting him go doesn't mean that you miss him and that you envision a life where cuz i mean this is the thing right every time you look at a christmas photo of like the four of you guys and everyone's smiling there's like one person missing and that's going to make i mean you're you're empathic and you're going to look at those smiles and you're going to be able to tell that in that christmas photo no one is smiling genuinely and when you look yeah. at other photos and you see those people smiling, you can tell the difference between... Smile with their eyes. Yeah, yeah right? Genuine yeah. smile or fake smile? Fake smile. Yeah, right? What's this one? It's hard, it's hard to look at it. Dude. <laughs> no. uh, that's a real one. Yeah. There it is. Yeah. <laughs> and so when, when you are home and everyone goes through the motions, it's because there's the thing. There's this like miasma of something missing. Uh, before we continue, is there anything wrong with the mic or mics or anything? You guys can every, everything's perfect. I, I haven't checked you. Yeah, ch chat I, usually yeah, check more. Uh, yeah, I think everything's fine on my good. end. Okay, good. Okay. Um. So where was I going? I was talking about how I can start doing laundry and things like. Yeah. Oh, okay. So I was listening to you talk to Destiny and um, you were talking about how everyone has been asking you about psychedelics. And I was assuming it's because I brought it up and that it's it's a little bit annoying for you, actually, that everyone, maybe, that everyone's asking about psychedelics because you don't view it as the way to climb the mountain. Right? It was an out, yeah? Yeah. Because I mean uh, it just kind of gets you to the peak of the mountain right away and you want people to more... Uh, slowly learn with meditation and some other ways to how, how to ca calm their minds, something like that, to, to climb the mountain. I, I heard you explaining to him. I'm yeah. probably not yeah. saying it how you said it exactly. Um, but I want to say that I think uh, that psilocybin saved my life because um, since I wouldn't have had the patience from a state of depression to... Uh, to believe that I could be happy. And since it got me to the top of the mountain right away and I saw happiness and I realized it was possible, then it, uh, it gave me hope. Yeah. That's wonderful. I was wondering what you think. Of, I was wondering what you think about that. Uh, I mean, I, I think that's great that that happened to you. I think, um, so to be clear, I don't want people to use psychedelics or not use psychedelics. I think, so here's um so here's what I think about psychedelics. So the first thing to understand is that there's a new wave of treatments being studied in psychiatry. Psilocybin, MDMA, ketamine. These are traditionally like drugs of abuse, but they're not like necessarily euphoric, right? So ketamine and psychedelics aren't necessarily like euphoric. MDMA can be. MDMA is yeah. euphoric, yeah. But and so we're starting to realize, like as a scientific, a psychiatric and neuroscientific community, that these have therapeutic value. So I don't dispute that at all. I've had patients uh, of my own who have had 
Uh, so one of my patients has had an opiate addiction or just all kinds of addictions since the age of 13. And he's like around 30 now. And he's comfortable with me sharing this general stuff on, on the internet. Um, cause he wants to, you know, let people know. And, and so he's been struggling with all kinds of treatments has seen like all kinds of psychiatrists and stuff, including myself and was still struggling and then went to, um, down to like Costa Rica or something and got treatment with Ibogaine and it was like transformative for him. And so I think these What's things, Ibogaine? Ibogaine is like another, it's like an herb that is like sort of hallucinogenic, but it's like ayahuasca, uh, sort of. But the other thing that Ibogaine does is reduce the severity of opiate withdrawal symptoms, which can make people feel like they're dying. So opiate withdrawal oh. is a really, really like painful process, but it also has psychedelic qualities. I'm not advocating for for its use. It's not FDA approved. There really aren't many studies around it or anything like that. Um, but I, it's not that I want people to do something or I don't want people to do something. I think there's clear evidence that there's value. And I think that there are shortcomings. So, for example, I went and I hung out on my Discord the other day, which is actually really cool. So I didn't realize that our Discord has, now has like thousands of people in it. And yeah, you guys should hang out in there. It, yeah. And so I was like, I was like, wow, like, let me just go hang out. Cause I used to hang out on my discord all the time when there were like eight people there in like 2019. But, um, and, and so I, I went on there and people were talking and this one guy mentions, he says like, yeah, I think like psilocybin is great because this one guy lost 200 pounds after using psilocybin. I thought was a, like, that's a cool. And he was like, that's a friend of mine. Oh, okay. Yeah. So he, um, so yeah, I, th I think they, they mentioned something about that. And, and so they, they were kind of talking about debating like the benefits of like meditation or psilocybin. And if you can get there with psilocybin and lose 200 pounds and this guy lost 200 pounds from psilocybin. Then, yeah. I introduced him to it. Yeah. So then why, why, why bother meditating? And I think that's fine too. So like, I'm not disputing that people have had positive experiences. In fact, the data suggests that people have positive experiences with some of these substances. The question is. What is the probability that someone, if I take a hundred people who are overweight and I give them psilocybin, what is the probability that they'll lose weight? You're asking me? It, yeah. I mean, I think that's the question. In I, my I, mind. I, I think because you're asking this question that it seems like you have never tried it. I've never tried psilocybin. I've, yeah. So if you had, you would think it's pretty high. No, I, I'm, I'm not. You, I'm not it saying. It helps you step back. Yeah, yeah. Maybe you're not saying it's low, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because it helps you step back from your day-to-day -day perspective. And day-to-day, -day you might be thinking something like, oh, I really want cheesecake or a Snickers bar. But then if you are on psilocybin, you're looking at your life uh, as a more long-term. And you're, you're thinking, oh, if I don't eat a Snickers bar or cheesecake right now, uh, I'll feel better in the future. And you can really feel it. You can really see that that's true. And... Uh, that's why it helped my friend lose 200 pounds. Yeah. So I, I'm not, I don't mean that question. So I recognize that oftentimes people who ask those kinds of questions imply that the number is low. I'm not implying that the number is low. I'm actually I, asking. I wasn't thinking you, I wasn't necessarily thinking so, you were. Okay. So for example. What, what do I think the number would be? I mean, I have no idea. I, I think the number would be, I don't know. Okay. We have, we need a base. I think it would be higher than if you gave them any other treatment. P possible. So for example, like there's one study on MDMA where they just took normal, healthy people and they, in a controlled sub, uh, uh, in a controlled environment, they give them, it gave them MDMA and they had therapists like process whatever they experienced through the MDMA. Yeah. And then something like they, it was a small sample size. So like 25 people, but like 80 or 90% of the people thought it was one of the most positive experiences in ever in their life. And I think none of right. these were M had any history of MDMA excuse. So they, I mean, use. So they, they kind of like, they ranked it up there with like the birth of their children and things like that in terms of like how significant yeah. it was. Yeah. So it could be mind opening, I think. Uh, it helps you remember how much you love other people, things like that. But MDMA, uh, you can't really take that all the time. So yeah, it'd be like a once in a while transformative experience. Uh, but if you take it all the time, I think it destroys your serotonin receptors. Um, whereas uh, with mushrooms, uh, there haven't been enough studies, but you can take it way more often and it doesn't have ad adverse effects that have yet been documented, right? Yeah. So, so, I mean, my general take, first of all, is that we don't know, but there does seem to be 
good suggestions of therapeutic and useful indications. I mean, I have lots of friends who have used hallucinogens and stuff like that and really love them and, and swear by the experiences so they've had. I, I want you to try psilocybin at least once because then I give you so much perspective. I mean, it is getting FDA approved, right? And you need to know what you're dealing with. If you're talking to a, a patient who's going to try it after it's, after it's completely legal for depression, uh -huh. then for you to really put yourself in their mindset, you would have to have tried it once. And I think if you try it, and I, I, it would make me really happy because then yeah. I feel like I can dive deep with you and relate. So let's just unpack that for you, a second. Do you think you'd be open to that? Um, I'm open to talking about it. Okay, great. So let's first start with, do you think that, let's start with this. You're, you're assuming that you, you have a very important assumption, right? Which is that if I better, if I have an experience myself, my ability to help other people is improved. Yes. So I agree with that assumption in, I agree with that assumption. So part of the reason that like I work and resonate with gamers as opposed to people who are addicted to heroin or alcohol is because I know what it's like to play video games for like 16 hours a day and have my life go nowhere. Whereas yeah. I haven't had quite that experience with alcohol. And I think that those experiences are different. So I agree with that. And at the same time... Then you've also related to, to loss of a family member. And that helped me talk to you. Sure. But that. I think the loss yeah. of... A, so my experience of losing my dad was very different from you losing yeah. your brother. So I would Still, say that... Yeah, but... Uh, yeah. I think it was actually very, very different. So this, I think, is one of the dangers, Right is that you assume that my loss was similar to your loss, but I don't think it was similar at all because I barely grieved for my dad at all. And it was kind of a weird, so I was, I was very sad for a brief period of time and it was grief, but I kind of watched my grief in a very detached way and really wasn't very, I mean, I was upset. Like I felt the sadness and I felt the loss, but I also was bizarrely detached from it in the same way that you're sort of describing in psilocybin, you're like, oh, I don't want to eat a Snickers bar and your power... Like the power of that Snickers bar to alter your life and your thinking is low. And that's how I felt about my dad's grief, that I was grieving, but it, I saw everyone around me being affected. And I just actually felt a, a deep sense of peace underneath all of the grief. I felt like a really profound, and it was one of the most positive transformative experiences for me in terms of like securing me in my meditation practice. Why did you feel a deep sense of peace? It, did you feel a sense of peace because you were able to deal with it so well? I don't think I was dealing. So dealing with it is of the mind. So the thing that the reason that was so powerful for me is because there is something that I found within myself, which was calm and neutral and peaceful, which sometimes when you meditate, like if people have been meditating on my stream and stuff like that, and even when we meditate, sometimes you can find some degree of like this weird, like no mind peaceful place. And I thought that that would be shattered by grief. Because generally speaking, the more emotional I became, positive or negative, the more you shatter kind of like this peaceful meditative state. Does that make sense? Maybe not? Okay. No, it does. Because you you talk about how the meditative state is when the mind is off and the, the yeah. emotional Yeah. So, so the, the really fascinating thing is I saw that, that that thing within me that felt like blissful and peaceful was there despite the grief. So my whole understanding of like mind in this thing being separate, I had read about it and I had experienced it in a lot of different ways, but really crystallized during that, that part of my life. When I watched when I first saw my dad's corpse and like, I was overwhelmed that like, that's it. He's actually gone and you can see him. And I remember like touching his face and he was like cold, like an ice cube. And it's such a, strange experience to like have someone who you don't even realize like you touch people all the time especially mm -hmm. your family members and they're always like warm and soft right like it's kind of weird like when you shake someone's hand their hand isn't cold it's like there's life in there and like when i touched him i remember thinking like that life is gone in such a shocking i mean it sort of hit me there i i saw him but it was really when i touched him that I was sort of like, it hit me that this guy is gone and that he will never be here again. And I'll never be able to talk to him. And I had a lot yeah. of grief and stuff. Um, not really so much for my loss of him, but the thing that I was the most upset about is that 
he was, I, I remember the day that I got into medical school, he just started crying because I had been struggling to get into medical school for a while. And he was kind of worried. That's about really cute. Like that. And I yeah. hadn't seen him cry like that. I mean, he just like broke down and he said that you're going to be amazing. He's like, nothing is going to stop you now. You are amazing. Yeah. You're really, really good at what you do. You, you helped me a lot. Yeah. And I've talked to a lot of, I've talked to a lot of psychiatrists. And, and so he saw that, right? He saw that, like, you know, when I, I mean, I had a 2.6 GPA and was struggling to get into medical school. I never thought I'd be faculty at Harvard Medical School. And yeah. and he said, like, nothing is going to be able to stop you and that you should do good and you should help people. That's really cute. Yeah. And so <laughs> what, what I was sad about is actually that he didn't get to see that. So eight months after I got into medical school, he passed away. And, and so yeah. the, the thing that makes me sad, like, I remember like the day that, that I, I matched. Yeah, I can relate to that a lot, actually. Because I'm worried I want my dad to see me happy. I'm sorry? Before he dies. I want my dad to see me happy before he dies. Good. And I hope he's seeing me happy now. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I come back to my earlier question, Rectal, is do you want to have kids? <laughs> well, I think now if I could stay happy. Uh, yeah. then, and let's say like five years go by and I'm still stable, mm -hmm. then yeah, I would want to. Yeah. yeah. So I'm not, you know, pressuring you to have children, but I think it's, it captures a lot of, I think if you decide that that's the right thing for you and you have children one day, I think a lot of the things that we're talking about in terms of your dad being able to see you truly happy you know, it's going to bring up a lot of sense of sorrow and loss, but there's going to be like the other side of the coin. And, and yeah. you know, the goal here is to live like an integrated life where you have sorrow and pain and suffering. And you also have not just endurance because most people just tank their way through it. Right. But that you have like you have joy and and accomplishment. And that all of these things, like life is about all of those things. And the more that you bring all of those things together, the more complete your life will be. And the goal of life is not to not the avoidance of pain and suffering, right? Because that's what we gravitate towards. We want an easy job. We want more money. We want more comfort. We want people to love us. We want to be like respected and loved and all this kind of stuff. Uh -huh. But you want the whole spectrum. The shitty and the good. Yeah, I feel that because like I was saying before, well, yeah, the, the, the days that it's hard for me to put it to words, but the days where I'm crying about something uh, make life feel meaningful for sure. Um, what I really want from life, I want to feel, uh, I want to feel connection with people. I, uh, working on Neverland, it's been making me feel like uh, I'm with people together to accomplish a goal. That feels amazing. And I don't, you don't get that as much from streaming because streaming is more of a, a solo uh, mm -hmm. job for most people. Uh, and it's isolating. Whereas like game development's all wholesome and mm -hmm. happy. I love it. So... That's why I've tried to transition a little bit. Yeah. Still like streaming once in a while, though, because sharing emotion feels great. Yeah. And and so, like, this is the thing that really blows my mind is, like, we've always thought that, I mean, this isn't therapy, but that generally speaking, the, 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 the sharing of emotions and, like, airing, you know, our deepest, darkest feel, feelings and thoughts and stuff should be done in private. Like, what the fuck, man, doing it in public? That's really, yeah, it's the worst to just keep it private. Yeah. I right. think. So I, I think in, in my mind, like this stuff grows, and this is kind of what I was saying, and, and I, you had expressed some confusion because I don't think I was being clear, but that like these things, like our negative feelings when they exist within us and we don't show them to the world, they actually compound. And there's a really interesting example of this, that uh, two sides. One is that if you think about trauma, so when I work with people who have a history of trauma and they like, you know, if they're, they've been like abused as children and the abuse is ongoing, it's private and it kind of like lives inside them and no one ever sees it and it just eats them alive. And the longer time that goes on and the more they keep it within them, like the worse and worse it gets. Even if the trauma stops at some point, as long as that thing is within them, it just grows. It's like a cancer. 
The other mm. really interesting thing is if you look at uh, the spiritual practice of mantra or mantra, I think that actually operates under the same principle. So a mantra is something that is chanted in secret. So you're given a, a mantra by a guru and then you chant it. You don't tell anyone what it is. And my experience of mantra has been like the more private that I keep it, like the more it sort of grows within me. And it's kind of like it doesn't I don't let it out. The only difference is that it's positive instead of negative, which is kind of like really interesting. Um, but I think that there's just this general principle about human beings and psychology that like what is within us, like if we don't let it out, it kind of compounds. Yeah. And I think that there's a big difference between even though the emotions that you feel when you read that thing, because I think, you, I mean, you knew what you were getting into, but something within you gravitated, like you just pulled that out, right? Like you were like, you're like. I mean, I'm sure you've thought about it, but like no one else, at least, I mean, I had no inkling. I don't know if you've told me, you know, it's, it's kind of like, no, a, I, didn't, I didn't tell you. Yeah. So like no yeah, one, I knew, no, I knew I wanted to share it. Though. Yeah. So like you shared it and then you, there's some part of you that knows it's kind of like, you know, if you give a, a one-year-old, like a glass of water and they're thirsty, they're going to drink it. There's some part of you that is hungry for to release share. and to share yeah. and to not have it be like stuck within you. Because it's been stuck within you for a long time. Yeah, it really has. And so I think this is different. This reading is different. This reading has the sense of metabolism to me. That you're turning it from one thing into another thing. Turning it from one thing into another thing. So I'm, I'm trying to turn this ball of grief and loss into... Into what? I, I mean, I don't, I don't think that it stops being grief or loss. To be clear, it's just it becomes like a positive grief or loss. Like I don't know how else to put it. So when I think about you know the work that I do, like I was directionless and purposelessness, purposeless, but didn't have purpose and didn't have direction. And we do, we do need to think of a way to word this because it's. It, 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 it it makes sense to, to to share the grief. It becomes a positive thing that we you don't know how to word it, right? Yeah. So I mean, I I can tell you kind of what I I don't know specifically about grief, but I think like what happens is the negative parts of us, and this is so what I've come to realize is the things that we view as negative become a part of who we are, and that allows us to be the person that we need to be. And the person that we need to be is what doing your dharma is. Dharma is duty or responsibility. I could not do my dharma unless I was the summation of all of my experiences up until this point. Right. So and I, I don't think now I feel like part of my duty is to help other depressed people who have been in my experience. Absolutely. Right. So yeah, and it wouldn't it wouldn't have happened if yes. Yeah, so yeah. this is what's important about dharma. It's not about pain. It's not about comfort. It's about like when the first time we talked, Reckful, my life was a summation of experiences where I needed to be something for you. And I could not be that thing for you unless I had taken my negative experiences and turned them into something that you could relate to or that I could relate to within you that I, you know, I took the person that I am, including all of the good and all of the bad. And that's yes. what allows me to be the person that I am because I do understand hurt and I do understand loss and I do understand directionlessness. Yeah. And in your case, grief and loss, you know, seem like negative things and they absolutely are negative things, but they're also not negative things. They're just a thing. And whether it's negative or positive is a value judgment that the mind places upon it, which is, you should understand since you've done psilocybin that negative and positive is not real. It's what we attribute to it. And that a thing is just a thing. Somebody just gifted this bazillion subs on my stream and I don't even know. Sh Sherlock 93. Thank you for that, by the way. Uh, yeah, I don't uh, even know. People, people supporting uh, Dr. K and content like this, I think it, it is very important. And it, since Dr. K has decided to I, I, you said a lot of your colleagues were doubting that this would be a good idea for you to go online and, yeah. and do this. And I'm, I'm really happy you did it because you're, you're AOE healing instead of single target. Yeah. They're so better. they still don't know. But uh, 
<laughs> yeah, they still don't know. They'll they'll find out. Yeah, they'll so there's out, a decent but, uh, chance I'll lose my job if they find out, but that's okay. Not a big deal. No. I don't think so. Okay, I hope not. Yeah. Uh, that'd be ridiculous. But um, I uh, right before that, right before I said that, I had something to tell you. What were you just talking about? Um, well, so earlier you were asking me about psilocybin, and then we kind of got off on, on the tangent of grief and loss and dharma purpose, like understanding that yeah. things are yeah, neither just positive. Before, just before someone gifted a bunch of subs oh, the, to you? That, that there's no difference between positive and negative, that like those are valid right. judgments okay, so, that we apply. Yeah, this 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 gets a little difficult for me because um we can start you can you can say that uh about more and more things in life that there's no such thing as this, right? There's no such thing as the United States. We made it up, right? There are borders we made up in our head, right? And we just wrote it down that it exists. Or there's no such thing as money it's just numbers that we write down that exist because we wrote them down and companies no such thing right uh i mean sort of right yeah we could say there's no such thing you could keep saying there's no such thing about a lot of things but these things are inter intersubjective so, so, things that do they exist for us but objectively they don't exist no right? so what i'm talking about so i'm not talking about that right right i know i know i know it's a little different you're saying there's no such thing as a positive or negative experience it's what we attribute to it uh, so, and somebody else, sorry, it, so, it, someone, it, people are just gifting just gigantic amounts of subs. So thanks, low DPM. Thank but, you. Like people are gifting like 50 or a hundred subs. So. That is insane. <laughs> it's like, what the fuck? Uh, Thank you guys. So <sighs> no such thing as a positive or negative experience. So wreckful. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying well, to think it through. I have to critically think about it. Don't a, a, think. Time. Don't think. Close your eyes. Sit up straight. Now, before we do this, I, like, okay, okay, my nose keeps running. Anyway, I can't have blow my nose, but I'm also sick. I, I was okay, sick. Okay, yeah. You know? So then so don't the, worry about it. Next time. No, no. Next time. No, I want to do it. I want to do this. Breath. I, I just. It's hard okay, for me to breathe. We won't do breathing. Uh, no, I want to do it. I, 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 I'll blow my nose again, but I just, I keep, I feel bad. I keep going AFK, but you'll have things to talk about with them while I've got. Okay. I'll just I'll get thank, a drink. Too. I'll thank so by the so low DPM, dude. You have gifted like gigantic amounts of subs several times. So I am very grateful for your support. And also let me um I don't know how to delicately ask this, but do you need help? Because like something tells me that if, if something is resonating with you and this deeply and you need help, just let me know. Right? So I'm, I'm not trying to say that I don't appreciate your support, but like there's a part of me that just wonders a little bit about, you know, what, like, is it just that you're just a super positive, supportive person who wants to see the world become a better place? Like I can completely understand that. 90% of the chance is that that's what's going on. Um, but there's a small part of me that sometimes says that the people who go out of their ways to help others are the ones who have felt hurt really bad, right? So if I think about, like, people who do, like, trauma support and things like that, they're people who've experienced trauma before, Um and and so there's a part of me that actually like feels some strange sense of compassion like i'm very grateful for all the support you're providing and stuff like that but at the same time like i just wonder you know because a, a lot of times pain and suffering can turn into something really positive i mean that's exactly what we're talking about um but if, if, if you do need help you know let me know and it's okay to need help and thank you so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm talking to Reckles' chair. Um, yeah, so I think we did we did what we did uh, we did the hype train, and now we're getting lots of subs. Okay, so diagnose the chair. So in order to diagnose this chair, we must use this accent, or should we do the Indian one? We can talk about it. Okay, so the chair has is an Everland chair. 
Do you see that? Yes, it is his video game. He has to surround himself with the video game. And we will do the meditation. Well, now I feel like I, I felt inspired to do meditation, but now Rackful's going to come back. And I don't know what to do now. I'm uninspired. Um, Because I feel like sometimes I get inspired to like teach meditation, but now it's like the rhythm is broken. I know, right? We talked about this last time. It's like he spends a lot of time in the bathroom blowing his nose. He was washing his face last time, so I, I mean, he's probably just peeing. Also, I think part of the reason that Rectal could be feeling better is because he has sunlight now. Do you guys remember the dungeon that he used to stream from before? It was like dark, and now there's like light, which is amazing. If you guys feel depressed, you should get your vitamin D checked. Go talk to your primary care physician about that. Very common, especially in northeastern clim like northern climates. Um, also, if you're dark skinned, so if you're like have dark skin, like you're Indian or Hispanic or Latino or African or African American or whatever, or Southeast Asian, Filipino, um, and you live in like the northern hemisphere, you have to be careful because. Our bodies are very inefficient at producing vitamin D because we lived in climates where there was a lot of sun exposure. So if you live in a climate where there isn't a whole lot of light, chances are you're more vitamin D deficient than your Caucasian friends. So if you're like Scandinavian, like Scandinavian people have like very good vitamin D production because they just don't get a whole lot of light. Whereas like people who are brown, like myself, have very poor vitamin D uh, production. So get it checked. Um, so someone is up oh, dojo blue thanks for the subs i guess while we're waiting for Reckful, i'm just gonna thank people for subs andy milonakis thanks for the subs bro andy Wait, I'm confused. Who's Andy Milanakis? It sound are they just saying that because your name is Andy? Are you like the Andy from like Harvard Andy and CEO Andy? Is that the Andy that all Andys are? So you're <laughs> you're the Andy Andy? Yeah, that's what I'm wondering. Like anyway, you seem to be a famous person, so thank you for your support. Um, and I, I mean, I don't know, like you guys tell me that someone is a someone Andy, so I just assume, and then people are going nuts. So, so, uh, welcome to the stream, my dude. And, um, you're the Andy, Andy. Um, I, I mean, what are you guys, what are we doing? I, uh, I'm back, but I just spilled orange juice on my carpet. So one second. <laughs> okay. How does one go to blow their nose and spill orange juice on their carpet? Like, can we just... Can we just... Yeah, but I said I was going to get a drink after blowing my nose. <laughs> okay. Oh, shit. Sorry. It's just because I wanted to read chat. And, um... Anyway, I was going to like get all ready to meditate, but now I just, I, I feel like my rhythm is broken. We can go, we can finish our conversation about psilocybin, then we, maybe we can meditate. Yeah, I think we're talking to LS soon. Okay. Okay. Um, sorry, but I, I was going to meditate in a particular way, but I forgot what that was because I just got thrown off base. I was thinking maybe we could just finish our conversation about psil psilocybin and that way before I've we- I've been doing that breathing exercise you told me. This, uh, <laughs> yeah, good. How do you like it? I'm not sure I'm doing it exactly correctly. Okay. So can you do it one time? Yeah, sure. So show me what you're doing, actually. Let's, let's start there.
You should stop at like 33. Good. Yeah. So are you contracting your stomach? Or are you abdominally breathing? Because I see a lot of chest movement. So so when you breathe in. Is that bad? Y- yes. So, I mean, oh. like not like bad, but like belly breathe. So you want abdominal. So you want abdominal contraction more than chest. How do I do that? So this is what I want you to do. Sit up straight. And I want you to, as you breathe in, push your belly out as far as it'll go. Okay. Sit up straight. Yeah. As I breathe in, push my belly out as far as it will go. Okay, here we go. <sighs> Wait, as I breathe in, push my belly out. Yep. You feel that? You can expand it. Just pull. <sighs> yeah, that's fine. Okay. So so okay, try less hard. Just in a more relaxed manner. So just as you breathe in, just your, your your navel is going out. Your belly button is moving out, right? So imagine that your belly button is pulling out and you're sucking the air in through a vacuum. Does that work better? I think I'm doing it. Yeah. I'm always worried I'm getting tricked into thinking I'm doing it, but I, I could stick my belly out or whatever, you know? Yeah, so, so like, like, you know, imagine you're letting your paunch hang out. And you're just taking like a nice big breath, like you've just eaten, you know, like some good Texas barbecue. You just went to the salt lick and then you're like, if I stand up, can we know if I'm doing it better? Yeah. You have to turn to the side though. Okay, sure. Okay. So I'm going to turn to the side. Okay. Yeah. Can't see my face. Does it matter? No, no, no. We don't need to see your face. We need to see your Okay. Here we go. (laughs) Good. Uh, okay. So, so here's the, okay. So, okay. And when you breathe out, close your eyes. Don't look, close your eyes. Imagine you're pulling your belly button towards your spine as you breathe out and you're expelling all of the air out of your chest. I'm pulling my belly button towards my spine. Okay. Does that make sense? Or is the imagery confusing? Doesn't make sense. It's not like I have a fu- it's not like I have a solid frame of understanding of what you're saying, but I could kind of try, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just I'm, like I'm, a- I'm just saying so so breathe in and out and let your belly move in when you breathe in. I mean, sorry, belly move out. Yeah. Oh man. Okay. Yeah. Oh, someone has a good suggestion. Lay on the floor yeah. and put a book on your stomach. That's a great okay. suggestion. All right. Is it bad if I don't own a book? Just put put something on your stomach. Something that we can see. Yeah, that. Great. <laughs> oh, the cookie monster's better though. He might fall over. That's okay. Just lay down. Good. We can All see right. you. Good. Good. And out. There we go. Let him let him all the way down. All the way down. All the way down. There we go. <laughs> this is this has gotta be hilarious for people who are just trying to see they're like, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> There. <coughs> okay, we're gonna kill Reckful okay, with our breathing. Sick. Okay, it's no fun. breathing, no breathing, <laughs> Reckful. That's enough. <clears throat> so seriously, I when... spit. <coughs> <laughs> this is oh, yeah, this is a horrible attempt at meditation, is what this is. Okay, that's okay. Just bring okay. bring the chair back. You shouldn't you shouldn't do breathing meditations when you're sick, dude. It's not good. Oh. For you. Yeah, so it's okay. Okay. Also, people are like super, super confused about what's happening, which is great. Sure. 
Um, uh, what were we talking? Okay, so we're talking about getting you to try psilocybin. Yeah. So let's just so let's take a step back. The reason that I was asking you to do this, so we can we can uh, we're gonna are both of your nostrils equally clogged? The right one's a little more clogged. Okay. So we're gonna do that same left gang right gang thing that we did last time. Yeah. At the end, but we'll talk about psilocybin. And the point that I, I was going to make with meditation is that when you meditate, you experience a sensation. The sensation is not good or bad, right? Like, so life is just experiences and we tend to, I mean, my argument falls short even in my own head whenever I think we about We tend to pick one as the experiences as good or bad. Yeah. So I would, I would associate it with good, the meditation experience, yeah. because it's calming and it, I think it releases endorphins. Maybe it seems like it does. You, you it, it's something. Something feels like it's tingling in my brain after I meditate. It feels really. Yeah. Nice. So, so I mean, this it's just false... an association. We're we're deciding that it's good. No, no, uh, oh, no, no. But I think the reason it's good is because we sit with an experience without associations. That's what feels good. Like we, oh. what we feel, what feels good is when our mind is not associating or placing value judgments on things. Monka, hmm. Right. And, yeah. and so when we meditate, it actually, we're just sitting with an experience fully. And that's why I'm like mindful eating or like mindful, like Instagramming or mindfully like watching the sunset is so great because like the more that you just do something without like your mind attributing a value judgment to it. So my favorite exercise is that I ask my patients to step in dog shit. So we work our way up to it. Really? Yeah. Barefoot. So what we do is like, cause I we, like that. Cause, cause the thing is like, if you think about the experience of stepping in dog shit is not bad, right? Like the actual sensation of stepping in dog shit is not bad. Yeah. Actually it's probably kind of smushy in a nice way. It's just warm. like, it's just like if you stick your toe in the mud, but stepping in dog shit is bad, <laughs> but yeah, but the experience is different from the value that we apply to it. So you don't, I mean, there are like safety concerns too, because if you've got a cut on your foot or something, it could get infected. But my point is that like, that, that we apply a lot of attributes to the experiences that we have. Yeah. And, and my experience, my experience has been that the more you can sit with an experience purely, the less bad it becomes. And that sitting with an experience purely is sort of a relatively like enjoyable, blissful state. And when you but describe, aren't you saying that sitting with an? Aren't you saying that the experience of sitting with an experience, without thinking about whether it's good or bad, is a good experience? Yes, yes. That's exactly what I'm saying. Exactly. And I would argue that when you think about the way that you describe, um, so for example, I just got a one hundred dollar don donation. So thank you, Waldemar. And and so I think that that's a good thing. But if I were fully tranquil. That would be no different than getting a one dollar donation. One of my chat said you broke my brain. <laughs> Recful broke. I think that's what he meant. Right? Yeah. So, so that he broke my brain. I mean, if you just think about it, like even even, and you can try this. That you can take experiences that you normally. So my the the example that I use is like also I take like this very bitter like Indian herb. So I don't know if you guys have ever heard of neem. Yeah. But neem is is. A particular plant and it's like super super bitter and uh -huh. if you just eat a neem leaf it's an awful experience until you do it fully mindfully and then if you do it fully mindfully like it's actually not that bad it's just super it's like the most bitter thing you've ever tasted but bitterness in and of itself is not necessarily bad right okay so on psilocybin you'll do everything you could do everything very mindfully and you you'll just taste something and be like oh actually why why is it that I never enjoy this? Exactly. You'll you'll drink you'll drink it and you'll think, oh, yeah, 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 exactly. Okay. Exactly. So so you so I think psilocybin creates separation between the mind and the self. Yes. Right. And and so that people find to be peaceful and blissful and and enlightening. So like not uh -huh. only do you gain more knowledge, but you gain peace and you gain some degree of enjoyment mm -hmm. and and so that's also like i've always thought it's weird that like moksha which is the word for enlightenment like gets translated as different things it gets a, a, a translated as bliss it gets translated as liberation or freedom and it gets translated nirvana. as enlightenment and so one What's is nirvana? like huh nirvana is What's moksha. nirvana moksha same thing but yeah it's also a nirvana right yeah 
Um, and so it's just weird that like one word has like, you know, if you think about it, like freedom and happiness are like two different dimensions of, of things, right? It's not like the same yeah. category. Uh-huh. But in this state of mind, if you've done psilocybin, like you kind of know what I mean, that like there's sort of bliss and there's like, you know more things and you feel better. And knowing and feeling can kind of like, there's a state of mind where knowing and feeling can like, co- like peace and knowledge sort of come hand in hand, which is not usually how we think about peace and knowledge. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. 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 So a- as to my personal take on, on meditation versus psilocybin. So I think that psilocybin is, has less research to support it. So generally speaking, when people meditate regularly for a long period of time, it does a lot of things to your brain. Yeah. And I think that those things are probably more reliable based on my experience of hearing people talk about psilocybin than, than, um, yeah, but you need to have the experience too. Okay. So I think it's, it's probably very similar. I I think, I I think it's, I agree with you though. There's thousands of years of, uh, people have been meditating for thousands of years. So, and and passing down the knowledge, right? So I'll give you an, Uh, of the benefits. Yeah. So I'll give you an ex- a prime example of why I think meditation is probably better than psilocybin. So the state is the same. So I think once the you get to- The state you achieve is the same. Is the same. Or arguably, people say that in meditation, you can get to states higher than psilocybin, although you know unclear what that means. But the one thing that you don't get from psilocybin is a practice at concentration and the focus of your mind. So I don't think that psilocybin- That's not true. I got to stop you there. Okay. You do get practice and concentration and focus of your mind because it has, has you stepping back and realizing all the time that you aren't being mindful constantly. You're, you're just like, you're, 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 it makes you present. No, so you I get think making you present. Okay, go ahead. You're, you're getting the, uh, I need you to try it. I need okay. you to try it. That's why. Yeah. You'll do it. Okay. So uh, it, it, we can go to, TwitchCon is in Amsterdam, and we no, could you could buy it over the I'm counter. I'm not saying I'm going to do psilocybin. I'm saying, oh, okay, please Just saying continue. that we can we can legally purchase it. It's okay. Uh, okay. Truffles over the counter in Amsterdam. Okay, uh, you know, okay. we could we can uh, in a TwitchCon, and I'll hang out with you. and We'll talk. It'll be great. We could stream. I don't know if we could stream it. I have to ask Twitch if they think it's okay. But that'd be cool. So so Wait, tell, people are tell saying me, this can't be t- real. Tell me more about tell me more about. Um, why you think that you train your concentration through psilocybin? Okay. Um, so, okay. So after I take psilocybin, um, here's my experience. Um, I will, I wake up feeling, um, I wake up feeling a bit empty every day, a little bit. Um, I wake up with low, uh, not, not too much motivation, all those um, I'm trying to really put myself there. I guess I have time to think about it. Okay, and I'll, I'll take it, and then after it hits, and uh, I, I take it every single day. So I'm on it right now, always on it. Uh, it's not a big dose. It's not. I don't get high. I take a one gram, which people get high on like three point five usually, and I probably built a tolerance. Um. Once I'm on it, then I'm able to do the tasks that I usually would find impossible to do. I wasn't always able to do them. It also took me changing my mindset. So now I'm able to clean or do laundry or organize my room or plan ahead in ways that were hard for me before. Okay. And just just like I told you, my friend Greek took psilocybin and, and decided to lose 200 pounds or decided he wanted to lose weight and lost 200 pounds. Uh, or you, you heard that elsewhere. I didn't even yeah. tell you. Um, then uh, I'm able to think, oh, if I do this, if I clean my, if I organize my room, it will, everything will, will just feel better in the future. I'm not thinking moment to moment. I, I'm able to zoom out. And, and also, yeah. And so, I think, yeah, I, I'm, I'm able to also think, uh, I'm also, I, I'm, not, I'm not quite getting it the explanation there i can't do it so let me let me it's try really to, hard to explain yeah fine yeah go ahead uh, so so let me let me try to tell you what i'm hearing and how i'm interpreting that which could be wrong because i haven't tried psilocybin sure. so i think what you're talking about is the after effects of something called samadhi so samadhi is a state of temporary enlightenment and when people have samadhi they change 
and their outlook changes, which means their behavior changes, and what they can accomplish changes. It's like a moment of realization that changes the way that you move through the world. So like with my patient Uh who was on Ibogaine, they had an experience where they saw like the addiction within them is like this serpent that was like coiling around inside them and like eating different parts of them. And like they took that serpent out and they like, they like shed it and it wriggled and it fell off of them. And then they like felt like, and then like they're, they, it changed the way that they interacted with substances in the future from that single moment in time. Is that what you're describing? Like their behaviors change and they're the, the product of their mind in terms of what it decides to do and doesn't do changes from this singular experience. There's so much more to it than that. Okay, could be. That singular experience gives hope. The singular experience makes you realize you, you can be happy because when you're sad, you think it's impossible. You can't see a reality where you would be happy. I would feel, doesn't matter what I do. I've tried traveling. I've tried streaming. I've had a lot of fans, you know. I've had a lot of money. I've tr- I've tried to live in a nice place. And no matter what I do, it doesn't feel good. I, I can't feel happiness. And I've, I've had a, a girlfriend who I really felt close to and loved. And uh, we, we were traveling together in Japan, which is my favorite place to be. And I still wasn't happy. And now if I take psilocybin, all those same experiences become meaningful. And I feel... Like I'm a full, whole human being. I feel like there was yeah. something missing in my in my brain, and it, it connects it and it makes it work and it, it makes me feel these these feelings that other people must be experiencing. Okay, so that's very useful to hear. I think that that's a broader conversation. So that concerns me because in order to engage in life, it sounds like you need psilocybin. So that just bothers me. Right. So my hope is that there is a way for you to engage in life without psilocybin to have those fulfilling experiences without it. Right. That's, I, I, that would be great. That's a value that would, judgment that I place. But let me just That go. would be great, but I don't mind. The, okay. the, like, some people are like, oh, I don't want to feel reliant on any substance or something. Yeah. So, But I mean, I'm, I'm also reliant on eating food every day. I will die if I don't do that. So eating one extra food every day, a mushroom, uh, I don't uh, yeah, feel so, so too I, bad about I, I don't want to go down that road right now. What I want to focus on is what I was saying about training your concentration. So this is something that I'm not sure that psilocybin does. Someone's making fun of my logic. That logic doesn't work. How come? No, let's forget Actually, about why doesn't that logic. It, forget yeah. about the logic, please. I'm, Everyone's can, calling me a drug addict. No. no. <laughs> Drugs Ign- ignore the okay, Can we address that though? That they're all calling me a drug addict. I feel like it should be addressed. Uh, hmm. I mean, we can. I don't. I <laughs> you really don't want to do it. <laughs> I, I, I don't. I think that's gonna. Take, I really don't want to do it. <laughs> I, I think it's. I think it's gonna take more time and energy than I have the inclination for right now. Okay. Um. Do you think I'm a drug addict? What does that mean? What What do you mean by the word addict? That I'm doing something over and over that will have an effect on me long term. I think what you're doing is not healthy. I'll put it that way. Okay. So I don't know what effects. So like scientifically, we don't know know what the chronic effects of psilocybin use are, right? We just don't know. And we all have okay, different. Okay, but that, and you don't think it's not healthy. You don't know because they don't know. But yeah. So I think what you're doing is not healthy. I don't know if what you're doing will have. Oh, so there's a difference. You don't between... know if it's not... no, no, no. But you don't know if it's not healthy. Exactly. So I think what you're doing is unhealthy for a whole host of reasons, but that doesn't okay. necessarily have to do with you being dependent on a substance, because generally speaking, psilocybin is not a substance that you form a physiologic dependence to. Right. So, like Good. when we think about addiction, we think about someone who's determined de- developed a physiologic tolerance to a substance. So I am addicted to caffeine. Because if I don't have caffeine, I have withdrawal, right? Yeah, so that's so I, yeah. an addiction. I don't drink caffeine. I don't drink alcohol. Yeah. I don't smoke People, weed. I don't drink yeah, those so, things. So the other problem with this, this conversation, the reason that I'm hesitant to engage in it is because it's not about logic, right? There, there's way more here than logic. There's, there's values. There's judgments. There's perceptions. Yeah. 
their senses I'd of like identity. to explore all those, but we I can don't have explore time today. all of those yeah. next week because that's yeah, yeah, yeah. a that's a long conversation. What I want to zero it, in yeah. on, just because I, I, maybe no one else gives a shit about this, but I feel like it's important because you people Let's ask ask questions about the difference between meditation and psilocybin. Okay, so yeah, one of the so on meditation that. offers lots of benefits, and it's not just the state of samadhi. So the state of samadhi is, I think, what psilocybin gives you, which is sort of like a state of self outside of the mind, which gives you a sense of peace and realization. Fine. Arguably, meditation leads to other kinds of benefits, right? So they're like spiritual powers, which people claim that you can gain through meditation. I won't comment on those today, although if people are super interested about that, we can have a uh, we can talk about that. I don't know if psilocybin lets you do those things. Um, the The thing that I will be very concrete about is that there is a particular practice of meditation. The first stage of meditation is dharana, which is not actually a state of mind. It's a practice. So when I sit down and I say, focus on your breath, and my mind starts to wander, and I train my mind to come back to the breath, and it wanders again, and I train it to come back, and it wanders yes. again, and I train it to come back, Every time my mind wanders, it's like doing a mental push-up to focus my attention back on the thing. You're getting better at focusing your attention. I agree. And and so it's like basically like going to the gym for your mind because you're going through a particular mm -hmm. redirection of attention time and time and time again. And what that means is that when I intend my mind to go in a particular direction, I get better at training the mind to follow my commands. Yes. So I was arguing that I do the same thing on psilocybin because I, I start my day and I'll train my mind to, okay, here's I'll allocate my time in a certain way. I need to here. I need to work on Everland for two hours right now. I need to, I've never been able to like, you know, schedule things or because, because I started doing it, I'm able to schedule things all the time. So I mean, I, now I can have every single so week. I here's stream the on a question. Day and a certain is, if time you're, never if you're not on psilocybin, are you still better at that stuff? Yes. It's la having some lasting effects when I'm not on it. So I, I am still a little better, but no, so, I, I don't, I can't like clean my room or organize things or, uh, stick, be as, be super punctual, but when I'm on it, I can be really punctual. Yeah, I, so I, I, don't I was think more that punctual for this, this I mean, so that, meeting than we were, you were right. Yeah, you were absolutely. Um, yeah. and so, so I, I think that that's, so that I don't know. I mean, cause it's kind of like you're, you're saying like I can function on caffeine Right. But I can't function. Yes, without it's, a similar, it's a very similar effect to caffeine, actually. Yeah. So so but that implies to me. So that's not how meditation works, though, because meditation like but, no, but levels yeah, but up it's your both. Right. So it's giving me the caffeine feeling of I can function, but it's also giving me the perspective feeling, the step back feeling that I can direct my attention feeling. Maybe you can also direct your attention on caffeine better. Yeah, I guess so probably you can. Let me put it this way. There it's is not, you don't think I'm doing the mental push ups. I don't you're think saying. you're doing you the think... mental push ups. That's and, I I I I'm I'm trying to figure out if I am yeah yeah I'm not so sure. so I, I don't that's why know, I want you to try it maybe you'll know I don't know if, I, if you're if, doing the mental push-ups um yes yeah, and so if I, you're doing the mental push-ups that'll help advance people's knowledge of the connection or the similarities between psilocybin and meditation just by you trying it once you could figure it out yeah so we also need to have a conversation of why it's so important for you that I try psilocybin right so like what does that mean to you. Because like I'm getting means a, a lot. I I can see that, right? So we yeah, have to yeah, understand yeah. why it's so important to you. And I because think I want I want to know if I'm going on the correct life path by trying this every day. Basically, yeah. Right now you're in disagreement that I am. Okay, and then no, I didn't say that. Uh, this F, the the FDA approval is leaning towards no. maybe this will be a. a, a, a I didn't say that you're on the wrong life path. Probably. I never said that. Yeah. Right, but you think I'm doing something unhealthy. Sure. Now I want base. I think if you try it, but didn't we just have a long conversation we'll know. about how things like make us the people that we are, and that things that may be perceived as negative? Yes, we did. So I don't think that you're on the wrong path. You asked me a question, and I'm not talking to you about psilocybin. I, I want to know. know. Yeah, I want to know. I want to. You're know the your, one who's asking sure. me. Do you, do I think it's unhealthy? You're the one who wants me to try it. So like, right, there's something I, going I on. Right, I value here. your opinion. I value your opinion so much on this topic, and the only way I can really get your opinion is if you try. Okay, so I think we should have two conversations now. One is about why yeah. it's so important to you that I try psilocybin, and the That's, second, yeah, which we're having right now, yeah. and the second is you know, this whole issue of whether you're an addict or not. And if you want to talk about that, those may be related.
Okay. Um, but anyway, I, I think, um, yeah, I mean, I think those are both full conversations, which I'm more than happy to have. I'm, I'm thrilled that you're very interested in it, and I'd love to have those conversations, and it sounds like we've got more stuff to talk about. I just kind of have to wrap up in a little bit, and I was going to see. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, it's been two hours. Um, people want to uh, have questions. Do do you do people have questions? Let me just look real quick. Let's uh, let's answer. Let's do a question answer thing. Yeah, I, I can look at some questions too. Any anyone have any questions? I'll, I'll read them right here. Fastest two hours of your life. Yeah, sorry. Okay, guys, can you stop making fun of me for trying to get? a uh, psychiatrist to take drugs please i'm sorry <laughs> yeah, I, I i don't i i don't i'm not offended and i don't think it's an appropriate res i mean i think if people want to make fun of, like you know twitch chat is twitch chat so they're going to make fun of what they want to make fun of i know it's kind of funny um, I, it's pretty funny I, I i think it's actually a really important conversation but i i do think twitch chat is picking up on something that there's almost there's a very i mean it, I don't want to use this word, but it feels right. There's some desperation within you for me to try psilocybin. Like, that's what it feels like. Like, I feel... Yes. Because and, as and, soon as you do... I, I And I don't want to be too pushy, which I'm being the too pushy for sure. Yep. But I know that as soon as you try it, you'll be able to tell me if I am doing these mental push-ups. If you tell me I am doing the mental push-ups, I'll feel better every single day. So here's the problem that I have life. with this in, in two seconds, Rackful. You need to stop yeah. living your life based on my validation. You have to decide for yourself... Right? That's, That's the true. fundamental problem. So I've like, already decided for myself. I want to do it. I don't think you but have. Then, I, then, I, then the reason I'm because reaching out have, outside you, for other opinions. Because you still I'm reaching have. Out for other opinions because addicts do the same thing I'm doing. Addict, like so a, you, an actual heroin addict would do what I'm doing and decide for himself. Exactly. What he wants so to there do. is a part of so you. I need your opinion. There is a part of you that has doubt. And you are looking for me to settle that doubt. I'm not going to play that yes. game. Oh, no. I didn't present this right. So it doesn't mean that we can't talk about it again, but my initial reaction is that you're looking for a green light from me, which the problem with that is not whether I give you a green light or the red light. The problem that I have with that is that like Reckful, you need to stop looking to me for green lights. This is a decision like that you have to come to, to on lights. your own. Huh? I kind of like looking to you for green lights. I know, lights and right I'm going to give you the green lights that I, I'm ready to give you, but for the rest of it, let's talk about it later. Let's do Q&A. Okay. Dodge. Sure. Q&A. I'm going to stealth and disappear. Okay. I'm, I'm getting him to try it, by the way. Okay. You, you'll see. <laughs> you'll All right. Switch on. Uh, so I have a few questions here that I can ask. So um, let me just see if these are for... Everyone okay. thinks I'm crazy. Don't, don't worry about it, Reckful. Seriously, I, I think you... So I think Twitch chat is on to something and we're going to explore that in our, our next interview because next I, week. Yeah. I, I think we, we should talk about it, but it's not, I don't think can we do Sundays from now on. Uh, yeah, we can, let me try. Can we do, can we talk if about you that? Can't online? do Sundays. Yeah. If you can't do Sundays, I'll, I'll, I'll do Fridays. It's no, I, I, I think I should be able to do Sunday. Um, okay. it's just gonna have to be the, uh, not this time. Right. Oh, wait, do you guys like Fridays? Chat. You guys really like Fridays. I guess that's a good Q&A. What day do you guys like the best for this? Oh, they love Fridays. Okay, we'll do Fridays if, if he's okay would, with Would Friday, Friday later in the day work better for you? No, this was great timing. Okay. Um, so somewhat, we kind of talked about this a little bit. How are you not crying after a wreckful read that? So people are wondering if I'm, because they, they were noticing I was smiling and I was sadistic. Sure, like yeah. That. So, Rekful, I'll kind of ask again. I know we kind of talked about it, but what do you, like, how does it feel to you when I smile you know, when we're talking, like, how does that feel to you? Well, the way I answered it last time was I thought that when you're smiling, it means that something tick clicked in your brain that you realize you're going to be able to help me. But you said that what you, when you were smiling, you feel hope for me. Yeah. Do I see I'd emotion? Like you feel hope for me. Do you feel less hope for me now no. that I'm a drug addict? <laughs> I, okay, I think good. I think I, it's, it's all it's all part of uh, so Rackful, it's all part of your road, man. It's all part of your yeah. path, right? Okay. So, I mean, it's it. You know, I I I do my best not to judge and like this whole like addict or not. I, I yeah. So I think sometimes I do like click, right? So sometimes it's kind of an intellectual like it's like a right before I like it's like I got him, like it's right before. Yeah. That. yeah. 
Um, and so sometimes it is that sort of like intellectual things clicking into place, but a lot of times it's just hope. And it's kind of bizarre because like I sometimes I used to get bothered by it when like people would come into my office and they'd like start crying and stuff. And I'd be sitting there yeah. grinning like an idiot. And then I'd ask them, how does it feel to you that I'm grinning like an idiot while you're crying? And they're like, it actually feels really good. <laughs> okay. And and so there's something- yeah, I, could, I could see it could be interpreted the wrong way, but I yeah. think most people who get to know you would not interpret it the wrong way. Yeah. So- I, have a, I have a question for you. That's yes. something you can ask your, sure. your uh, viewer base and your own time as well. Cool. I, uh, so I was going to surprise you, but I think it's actually better if, if you end up telling me and talking about it. Uh, I'm going to put you in Everland. Okay. You're going to be in the game. Cool. Uh, and you could have your own building or you could be meditating on a mountain, uh, I, whatever you prefer. And if you have a building, what would it be? What would you want it to be? Uh, and you could, talk, you could talk to your chat about it and they could help you decide in another time. Okay. So I, I feel like um, I already have an answer for you. Okay, what is it? And I, it's and if this is a cop out, I'm gonna ask chat because I feel like I don't think this is a cop out. But I, I think I think it should be whatever you think it should be. I oh, want okay. I want I want sure. you to build it. So like whatever you whatever inspired me to put you into the game, like put me into the game in the image that you feel is appropriate. Okay, great. I got it. Okay. Yeah, great. Thank you. Yeah. Nice. Um, so I have a question here. Is it okay to meditate after smoking weed? So marijuana, I think, is a whole different ballgame. So marijuana, I'm not a big fan of. Um, so I'm not either. I, 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 marijuana also has um, a lot of good treatment uses. So, for example, like the best evidence for marijuana, I have some like patients. Like glaucoma, who, right? Not just glaucoma. So like the most important clinical benefit that I've seen from marijuana is people who have opiate addiction and start using marijuana reduce their dependency on opiates. Okay. And so like from a public health standpoint, like people are dying. Like I said, they think 76 people every hour die from opiate overdose or 176 okay. or something like that. And so any, any substance that causes people to use less opiates, I think there's, there's room for. I have some patients that have depression and use marijuana from time to time. It's kind of funny because they like, they, you know, they come here and we, we do like meditation and all that kind of stuff. And then one day, like months after we've been working together, like, by the way, I smoke pot from time to time. It really helps me feel better. And and, yeah. and then I ask, okay, how much do you smoke? And I'm like, okay, like, look, you, you know, you're going to live your life. Yeah, I think it can, it can, the downsides of it are, it's difficult to get, have motivation. Yes. Uh, so yeah. mm -hmm. this is the real problem with, with marijuana is that marijuana is a cannabinoid and a lot of the receptors around behavior and habit have to do with cannabinoids and this gets like super complicated but basically when we look at and and so i think the real problem with chronic marijuana use is that it it destroys your motivational circuitry and so like if you have trouble finding a job or you have trouble studying or things like that by destroys it's unclear how much damage it does and, and what that what that looks like but it really hampers people's abilities to have an intention and follow through with that intention for productivity I've seen that firsthand on a lot of my friends. And, it, and so the, the, the people make counter arguments, right? Because they say like, oh, you have like, so I, I, I have someone, you know, I, I work with someone who I'm sure this is not going to be identifying, but I've worked with people at like major places like Goldman Sachs and Google who use marijuana on a daily basis. And the counter argument is, but there are super successful people who work at these institutions and use marijuana on a daily basis. And I say, yes, that's correct. That's true. At the same time, I think as a clinician, and you have to, as a clinician, you play the odds, right? So the question yeah, is, if uh -huh. I take a hundred people and I give them marijuana and I take a hundred people and I don't give them marijuana, what are the likelihoods that they'll end up in certain places? And I would bet anything that there'd be more of them would be less motivated. And that's what we see. So there's data su to suggest that, right? Which doesn't okay. mean that an individual... It doesn't like, and this is a big problem is for a long time, people thought that marijuana affected IQ, it like kills brain cells or whatever. I've never seen a situation where I think it affects like raw IQ. I think what it affects is executive function, which is like um, your frontal lobes, which is like being able to plan and execute complicated tasks. And it affects motivation. It engenders sort of habitual circuitry in your brain. So when we, and I know I said this is complicated, but I'm going to go into it because I can't help myself. So when we first start to do an action and that action feels good, 
that is mediated by dopamine in something called the mesolimbic circuit. So early on, actions, like when I wake up and I have my first cup of coffee ever in life, or let's not use coffee, let's use alcohol, for example. Um, And maybe this is a bad example because alcohol does things to your brain. So forget about the effects of alcohol in the brain. Actually, let's use video games. Video games is a good example. Okay, there you go. Yeah, Yeah, that's a lot better. So when I first play a video game and I say like, oh, this is lots of fun, that's dopamine acting in my mind, in my brain, okay? So dopamine Uh reinforces a behavior through the experience of pleasure. But what happens when people become addicted to games is they play the game for like 10 hours a day. And if you ask them on hour seven, are you actually having fun? They say no. Like, they don't remember yesterday where they played 14 hours of Diablo as being, like, one of the best days of their life. But I do remember, like, LAN parties, where I still remember, like, the LAN party where I played Left 4 Dead. And it was, like, a blast, man. Like, I remember that. It was so much fun. I was with my friends. We were trying to survive from zombies. It was, like, a blast. I remember specific gaming experiences of my life because they released dopamine. Over yeah. time, playing games on a couch feels with friends is so fun. And I, I, I after Everland, maybe I want to make some sort of uh, my, my lead artist, Frank, is really passionate about this too. Make some sort of game that gets people to do couch co ops again. Cool. Because, yeah, I, hanging I out with that. your friends. Yeah. Um, but so, so at the beginning of a behavior, it gets reinforced by dopamine. Over time, that neurotransmitter changes and it becomes a cannabinoid. So, endocannabinoids have to do with ha- actions related to habit formation. So once something becomes habitual, you don't enjoy it anymore, but you do it anyway, right? So if we think about like a behavior, everyone thinks that behaviors are reinforced by dopamine and pleasure circuitry because by now gamers are pretty smart and they're into neuroscience and they're into drugs of, you know, so like study about the brain and they read about the brain. Everyone knows about dopamine. What people don't know is that if you think about a habit, so if you think about a habit, like you don't enjoy the things that you do habitually. And the reason for that- That's why gaming's become less fun. Yes, because what happens is it starts to engender uh, the the neurotransmitters involved are cannabinoids, which have to do with habits and no longer have to do with enjoyment. So I think when you flood your brain with cannabinoids, now this is my theory. We don't really know. So we know that that marijuana reduces motivation. We know that marijuana is a cannabinoid. We know that there are some circuits of the brain, and I'm going to have to brush up on this and get back to you guys because I'm a little bit rusty. So take take what I say with a grain of salt. And we know that so we know the neurotransmitters of cannabinoids, and we know that uh, uh, marijuana reduces motivation. So my hypothesis is that since you're flooding your brain with cannabinoids, you're reinforcing a habit cycle around whatever the marijuana behavior is, which generally speaking is not productive. And so my sense is that like cannabinoids are, are not good because or it's not... Everything, everything in medicine and everything yeah. you put in your body has like a benefit risk analysis. Well, in this situation, good for you. You want people to be motivated and whatever. Yes. If someone wanted to just, you know, yes. uh, chill yes. forever, yes. then that would be good for them. Yes. Yeah. But I, I mean, but I don't think, yeah, I mean, I don't think that would be good for them because I think what they would be doing is chilling. And now this gets back to the question, should I use marijuana before I meditate? So let's think about why someone would want to use marijuana before they meditate. Chances are the reason that marijuana before meditation makes meditation way more productive, which it does for many of the people that I've taught, is that it quiets your mind for you, right? So then what happens is when you sit down to meditate, you feel like you have a more productive meditation session because the marijuana is reducing the activity of your mind. But if we think about it, part of the benefit of meditation is being able to wrestle with your mind in its current state. So it's basically like what marijuana does is it's like if you go to the gym and you're trying to train your attention and concentration and your ability for follow through. And I talked about this last Sunday. I uh, Not last Sunday, but the last Sunday stream I did was all about dharana. And dharana is basically like why I think people struggle to accomplish their goals. And it's, it's not, what dharana means is focus. And just as an example, so if I wake up on January 1st, 2020, and I say, I have a New Year's resolution, and I'm going to lose 100 pounds. And if you stop and you look at the mind in that moment, their resolve is 100%. It's not like half-assed. It's 100%, right? Their passion for their goal is like complete and pure and wonderful. What 
they're lacking is concentration of the mind. It's focus. Because the next day, then the mind is 100% towards working out. And the next day, you're no longer pointing in that direction. You're pointing in this direction. So mm-hmm. I think what people think of as a lack of willpower is not actually willpower. It's not the ability to overcome. Willpower is the ability to like overcome your internal impulses. I think it's actually a lack of focus. So a human, the, the average person does not get to choose what direction their mind points. So you got to think about your mind as a flashlight. I agree with you there. And so on January 1st, you could, train the, you could train the ability to focus it with meditation. Yes. So on January 1st, my flashlight is pointing towards weight loss. And on January 2nd, I move my flashlight to pictures of cats on YouTube. And the dharana is the practice of training your mind to put the flashlight where you want. And yep. so if we think about meditation, why do people want to use marijuana with meditation? It's because it, it's less trouble to focus your flashlight which in turn makes it easier to get to states of samadhi. And people think about productive meditation as states of samadhi, right? Which is like the no mind state or whatever. So people think like marijuana assists their meditation. And in a sense it does because it is easier to facilitate that. But I think what you're doing is you're missing out because you're going to the gym. And instead of like lifting a a 50 pound weight, you're taking all the weight off and you're making it easy for you to do curls. Gotcha. Yeah. So I don't think marijuana is, is, is good to use in terms of an assistive aid for meditation, but I fully understand why people do it because people don't understand that, you know, meditation yes. is a lot of different stuff and it's not just getting to the state of no mind and blissed out. That, that's not all that meditation is for. There are a lot of other benefits of meditation. Yeah. The, the, another thing, uh, marijuana also helps you fall asleep, but I think it's the same thing. It's just, you could use the same analogy. It's you're getting worse sleep when you you uh, sleep after weed. I don't think you get to REM as often. I uh, watched uh, Matthew Walker, some sleep expert, talk about it. Uh, and it, it's it, when you're trying to sleep from weed with weed. God, I feel like it's very difficult for me to talk about. When you're trying to sleep with weed, it's also like you're taking all the weights off of the gym and just yeah. falling asleep. But yeah, you're not getting good sleep. Uh, I, I feel like my mind's a little exhausted. Yeah, mine is too. So I'm going to do two or three more questions. Yeah. Um, I have a... Before anyone forgets, uh, you guys should follow him. Yeah. So he's he's at Healthy Gamer GG. It's here. I actually think you should uh, rebrand this a little and have like a picture of yourself somewhere. Yeah, at least. People have told me that. And maybe, maybe your name... Yeah, I'll talk about it with you. But I think maybe your name... Because you already have Healthy Gamer GG once, and now it's twice. I think maybe your, your name would be better, like Dr. Kanojia, right? Okay, sure. How do you pronounce your last name? Kanojia. Kanojia. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, and, yeah, uh, what else? So uh, I'll link it in the chat here. And that's and also follow him on Twitch. Is here. Okay. Boom, boom. Oh, I heard myself. I don't like that. Because I opened his Twitch stream. And then uh, I assume most of you already follow me. Yeah, so you guys should follow Rekful. I mean, everyone knows who you are, right? But maybe his fans don't. So yeah, if you guys are interested. No, I mean, dude, half of my, not half, 80% of my fans came from you. How do I link to you? (laughs) Boomer. Uh, Boomer, boomer, boomer. Yeah, you're trying to figure out how to link to me? Yeah, my mods have figured it out. Okay. Yeah. So you guys should. Reckful's awesome. So I'm a. I'm actually a fan of Reckful's. I used to Wait, watch so his. If you wanted to type in a URL to get to my channel, could you do it? Yes. Okay. Okay. Just making sure. <laughs> it's just twitchtv reckful, right? Yeah. You got it. Yeah. Oh. You just, my, yeah. My, my mods posted it, but I. I mean, I, I watch it. Oh, show. they posted it. <laughs> okay. But I, I. I know how to find. I. I just. I didn't know what your actual <laughs> name on on um Twitch was. Right, because like a lot okay, of yeah. uh, like, because I know you're wreckful. Because I, I mean, I remember watching your PvP videos from a decade ago, which, by the way, are st- still taken down from YouTube. I know, for... I saw. I looked at your YouTube channel. Yeah, I looked for the videos that but I saw. I told, I told. So it was on. It wasn't on my channel. The video you've seen, I guess, yeah. wreckful three is probably the one you saw. Yes, it has like five million views. Yeah, yeah. So it's it wasn't on my own channel. It was on a uh, a small channel with like twenty k subs called Complexity Gaming, which is my sponsor at the time. Uh, but they apparently got sued for 
some intro they used um sounds of something on their yeah, intro a, and it was a cool video, dealing with man. that yeah it'll be back up someday okay can we just do two or three more questions yes you do it okay so people are saying why do yogis in india smoke cannabis regularly and religiously so this is a great question so not all yogis in fact i'd say the a very small minority of yogis use cannabis and it is used as part of their spiritual practice so the yogis who use cannabis are part of a, a kind of um, tradition called aghori sadhana. Ghor means fear. Aghor means without fear. So they do things, they live, what they basically do, so this is actually a great question, because we were talking earlier about how an experience is just an experience, and it isn't like good or bad, and good or bad is what we attribute to it. So the goal of their sadhana is to do practices that normally engender fear and to do them with tranquility. So the 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 Aghori Babas, um, who are also apparently really good at giving boons and cursing people, so they do use marijuana. Um, sometimes there are like Himalayan yogis that use marijuana as well, but I think most of the pictures that people see are oftentimes of naked yogis who are covered in ash and are um, smoking pot and are unclean. So these people live in cemeteries. They coat themselves with the ash from cremated bodies. And they also do things like eat meat, drink alcohol, and sometimes practice cannibalism. So like, the, and the reason that they engage in all of these things is to like do these practices with like complete tranquility of mind. And it's kind of like stepping in dog shit. So stepping in dog shit is my like I new see. tutorial okay, okay. version of, of a Ghori Sadhana. The other thing about a Ghori Sadhana is it is recommended by a guru for a particular period of time. So you don't, you're, you're not an Aghori, you don't become an Aghori Sadhana, and I could be wrong about this, just based on my exploration. Supposed to do it for a small amount of time. Yeah, not a small amount of time, usually a decade. So they're, they're like lifelong Oh, monks. just a decade, okay. So, so they like, they'll spend 20 or 30 late. years doing like regular practice, right? And at the age of 40, they go and they live in a cemetery for about a decade and smoke a bunch of pot, and then they come back and then they give up pot again. Oh, okay. Yeah. Just NBD 10 years of eating people. Um, so I, I, I don't think that, generally speaking, yogis use jaras, which is marijuana, regularly. Um, okay. So if I, if I wanted to watch you step in dog shit, you'd say yes. Sure. That'll do. Okay. I'll right. step in dog shit. Is that something people are interested in seeing? No, yeah. Where do you where do you draw the line? So you won't eat people, I assume. <laughs> I won't eat people. That's correct. Yeah. Uh, what would you do that they do? Uh, I mean, I I I drink alcohol and I eat meat, but I don't okay. I don't do it as part of my sadhana. I just do it because I you know enjoy it from time to time. So That's I'm right. not interested in doing a gori sadhana. That's not my path. My path. I decided I would yeah, do a gori sadhana if that, something yeah. ever happened to my wife and kids, and like all of my material attachments were gone. I'd probably I'll become a monk again, and there a gori okay. sadhana may be a part of that. But we'll see. Um. But yeah. Uh. Let, can I do one more question, Rekful? This one's kind of about you. No, of course. I'm so, enjoying just listening. Do you think Rekful is looking for an easy way out of his depression? If so, do you think that his approach to his depression ultimately leading to the root? If so, do you think that is his approach to his depression ultimately leading to the root of his depression? I understand. Okay. So I think the question is, do you think Rekful is looking for an easy way out of his depression? And do you think that looking for an easy way out of your depression is the root of why you're depressed. That's what I think the question no. is. I hope it's a no. What do you think? Do you think you're looking for an easy solution to your depression? I was looking for any solution. So that part he's right, but it's not the reason I'm depressed. I was depressed to start with. Yeah. So I don't think that you're looking for an easy uh, solution. In fact, even though this solution feels good and remember Boys and girls, we're not treating or diagnosing any medical illness. I think that um, what you're doing, would you describe this as easy? No, I mean, I fucking cry my eyes out. Yeah. All the time. So I think like people need to remember that, right? Like, so what Recful is doing requires just gigantic balls of steel. Like, it's not easy. I have really big balls. 
Or are they made yeah. of steel, though, is the question. Like, what are they made of? I hope so. I'll have to palpate them in a non-medical way when we meet in Amsterdam. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> okay. Um, <coughs> we're just going to kill him right now. But uh, Okay, so what, uh, here's what I think is going on with Raffle. I don't think that there's an easy solution to his depression. And I think that what he's doing is hard, not just because he's doing it publicly. Doing it publicly sure is hard, but I think the really hard thing uh, and what is really amazing and what I respect and why I'm invested in continuing to work with you is because you're grappling with the things that are difficult to grapple with, right? Like you're zoning in to the raid and you know that there's like a gigantic raid boss on the other side and you're zoning in. And I don't think that like... Yeah, I've always wanted to uh, be challenged in that way. Yeah. And when I play games, I try to do the hardest thing in the game. And I try to beat it, right? And I think so. I'm trying to do that with my own life. Absolutely. And so I, I think that what you're trying to do is not easy. In fact, it's hard. It's very hard. So grappling with like the dark parts of ourselves, grappling with that inner thing that, you know, is is painful and difficult because it's safe, right? Like it's it's safe to actually just continue to be depressed and, and use psilocybin and kind of like hang out. And but but actually like dealing with your feelings and facing your feelings and talking about your loss. And also like talking about there, there are like undertones of stuff that we haven't even explicitly talked about, which is like, what is the conversation that you're going to have with your family? Because that's going to have to happen at some point. Yeah. My one uh, disagreement with what you said is it's safe to continue just being depressed. And yeah, you added doing psilocybin to the list. Yeah. It, there's this feeling where uh, you can just stay in bed over and over day after day and just watch a show and only get up to pee and just do it or just watch Twitch and just do it a month in a row you know and you just like can't get out of this you just do it over and over but i disagree that it's you can't you can't it's not possible to do psilocybin in that situation and then not get yourself out of it cool i i, I from my experience for me it wouldn't be possible mm -hmm. it's not the same for everyone yeah for greek it wouldn't be possible either and for any of my other friends who've tried it it's now like 20 or so people so 20 of 20 would not be possible to just stay in bed and be depressed. Okay, cool. That's my experience. Yeah, so I don't think it's an easy That's, solution. Uh, we need a clinical trial of, of a couple, uh, a thousand hey, people would be 20, great. I mean, 20 is 20 good. Um, and I don't think that his depression is ultimately due to, you know, him trying to look for easy outs for his depression. I don't think so at all. I mean, I, I, I don't even know that what we're talking about has, has even truly been depression because anyway, but. I think you've definitely got a some scar, so you have some kind of a lot of pent up emotions around, you know, the loss of your brother and and being yeah. a zombie on the inside and stuff like that. So, I, I anyway, okay. So let's meditate, and then we'll wrap up for the day. But so, you said I shouldn't meditate when I'm sick. Yeah, so you can meditate. I'm gonna try to do a meditation that has no breathing, though. So it's not a breath oriented meditation. Okay. Or at least, so. let me think about that. How can I do a non-breathing meditation? What am I going to do? Okay, we're going to do, we did this one a couple weeks ago, but we're going to do this one again. It's going to be a sound meditation. Yeah, yep. Oh, third eye. Let's do third eye meditation. Great. That one's even better. We're going to charge our laser beams. Okay. So I want you guys, yeah, let's do third eye meditation. Okay. So I okay. want everyone to sit up straight. So your back should be straight. All right, here we go. Uh, chat, we're doing it. You guys do it too. Okay. Sit up straight. So I want you to just take a, um, so I'm going to ask people to close their eyes and then I'm going to ask them to open them after a few breaths. And then I'm going to ask you guys to watch what I do. Actually, let me think about how am I going to do this. Okay, I'm going to teach you guys the third eye thing first, and then, but don't do it now. I'll tell you guys when to do it. So I want you to take your... Can I get banned for using my middle finger on Twitch? No, not if I do this, right? Can I do this? I'll just you, you got some supportive finger there that okay. it's giving a, a different meaning. Yeah. Okay. So normally, I mean, you guys at home don't have to use these two fingers because this is the middle one is the operative one. So the main thing is that the middle one is out. And what I want you the to do is... The middle finger needs to be out. Yeah, so there's a okay. spot that's like just right above your eyebrows and in the middle of your forehead. And I want you to just hover. Don't touch. No touching. Hover. 
hover your finger. Just, I wiped. Just a, just a like a, a a centimeter away from your forehead. So just that spot, but don't touch. Yeah. So you guys just find that spot. Okay, a little bit higher, a little bit higher, Rackful. A little bit higher. Yeah, a little bit lower. Wait, you see from the side? Yep, I I can see from the front. Okay. okay. So I want you guys to just train yourself to do that. Okay. But you don't want to touch. Now put your hand down. So now what we're going to do, put your hand down. Now what we're going to do, I want you guys to just remember that because I'm going to ask you to put your finger over your third eye in a second. We're going to do some deep, relaxing breathing first. And then we're going to do the the third eye thing. And then, so what I mean by that is like, so put your finger over your third eye. So I'll ask you to do that. And then we're going to stop the practice. So I'm going to ring the bell to signal the start of the practice and ring the bell to signal the end of the practice. And at the end of the practice, you should open your eyes. Okay. So go ahead. And close, close your eyes right now when yeah. the bell rings. Close your eyes. Okay. Now what I want you to do is take a deep breath in and out. In. Out. In. Out. Good. Now continue breathing slowly. And feel the straightness of your spine. And with each breath in, feel your body expand, your shoulders expand, your chest expand. And with each exhalation, let your body relax. So I want you to envision your spine like a pole. And your body is like clothing that's hanging on the pole. And with each relaxation, with each exhalation, let your body sort of hang off of the pole. But the pole should remain straight. Ball of analogy is now. And I want you to take a moment to hear the sound of your breath. And now place your finger on your third eye. Remember not to touch. Keep it like a centimeter or two away. Ideally not touching hair or any skin. And focus on the sensation of your forehead. Focus on that point on your forehead. Try your best not to think about what you're doing or what's happening. Just focus on the sensation. Keep your arm there. We'll practice for a bit. About two minutes. Direct all of your attention towards that point. And now let your hand come down and relax. 
and continue to focus your attention on your third eye. Direct your concentration into it. You may notice some residual feeling. Just feel what it is. I'm calm. Doesn't have to be breath, boys and girls. Does not have to be breath. What's that like for everyone? They loved it. Yeah, what surprising. A, huh? Surprising. I what's let's see what they said. Relaxing, what's surprising about awesome. It? Wow. I'm no I'm reading what they're saying. I don't know what was surprising for him, yeah. Relaxing. So let's ask people what was fucking awesome. Yeah. What was surprising for you guys? The feeling generated it was surprising. Absolutely perfect for a Friday after work. Feel renewed. Actually calmed me down. I leveled up. <laughs> Had a weird headache for a moment. Good. So not all techniques work for all people. Some people in my chat. So one person described it when I, you know, when I did this, when the stream was relatively small and I could actually read the messages. One person described it as charging a laser beam. Does that make sense to anyone? So people are just saying weirdest feeling I've ever had. Some feeling... Some people are saying yes, some people are saying no, some people are saying kinda. Um, and so some people experience something like a tingling sensation, which is fine. And if you don't feel any of those things, that's fine too. Don't worry about it. Um, there are 112 different techniques of meditation, one of which each supposedly is going to be like natural and give people sort of an easy access to samadhi, which is a spiritual experience. And so if this is not the one that works for you, that's okay. It doesn't mean that you're doing anything wrong. It's just different things work for different people. Um, and so if you did experience a sensation, I would say that this is a good technique to practice. So do it at home. Do it for a few minutes at a time. You okay, Rekful? Yeah. Okay. No, there's, um, uh, there's a video. Uh, 112 is a popular number in the uh, gaming space. Okay. Uh, there's a video of uh, Ryan Lockwood. is uh, a guy speedrunning GoldenEye 64 for N64. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> his best time before the speedrun, I think it was 114. And uh, he, he gets really excited that he skipped 113 and he got a 112. And he's like, screams, I am a legend and stuff like that. It's a good video. You, you feel the emotion. Cool. You should watch it on your own time. I yeah. will. I'll watch it right now. Um, so right now. <laughs> you don't have to watch it right now. <laughs> All right, let's watch it, boys. Okay. I, well, I was gonna. No, I was gonna go ahead. It's not calming. And, Actually, and it's a weird transition from being this calm to watch that video. You should watch it a different time. I think. Okay, sure. So, who should I rate? Rekful, are you streaming? Or are you 